Welcome, everyone, to today's podcast episode. You're listening to the Home Design Podcast. My name is Adam Case, your host, and we aim to educate, inspire, and connect South Florida within the industry authorities within their trade. Today, we're gonna be discussing real estate, but not just any real estate. We're talking everything that has to do with investing in Airbnb and different types of passive passive income opportunities, all with Mari Juliet of Mari Juliet Real Estate. How you doing? (laughs) Good, how are you? Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. Absolutely. So I'm excited about this because real estate is always top of mind for everyone. Doesn't matter if you've already bought your home, own your home, want more homes, selling a home, buying your first home. But before we get into that, who is Mari Juliet? Okay, so (laughs) we're here actually in Broward County in Pompano Beach. This is my hometown. So I'm born and raised in Pompano Beach. I've always lived in South Florida. Um, growing up, I, my parents were both in real estate, but in the mortgage business. Okay. So I kind of like learned a lot about that growing up and my parents flipped houses my whole life. So within, you know, the five mile radius, we probably lived in like 10 different homes, but they would see a house across the street that needed work and say, all right, let's take a dolly and like move our stuff over, <laughs> rent that house out and redo this one. So pretty much every house I lived in growing up was a renovation project. Wow. So I learned a lot about that. And once I got my real estate license, I was able to kind of navigate that and show people, here's how much it would cost to do this. Here's how much it would cost to do that to renovate your property. And I really specified in investments, uh, particularly multifamily investments. And I saw the difference in income between, you know, a duplex that my investor had and then a short term rental in the same neighborhood. Okay. So that's where I kind of started educating my investors on short term rentals, that income, everything. Um, but that snowballed into gaining a huge clientele, uh, promoting everything on social media, which just made everything snowball more. And that, uh, led to me opening up my own brokerage and having agents who are really highly trained on investing and running numbers, everything. My biggest thing with my business is I never want to waste a client's time by putting them on an MLS auto email kind of thing and saying, Let me know what you think. Right. Um, I really train them to run numbers every day, only send properties that make sense. Like we really have to make sure that the property is going to make the client money because obviously with investors, if you do a good job the first time, they'll buy, you know, sometimes five properties in a year. So we really try to gain that trust with the first property so that we can help them. And some of my clients, they'll start with $125,000 property we buy and sell a few. And then the last property they sell is like 1.5 million in a matter of a few years. So it really depends on the specific investor. And I love to kind of brainstorm on what works best for them since it's not one size fits all, as you know, it's kind of all over the place. (laughs) No, absolutely. And that's the thing because real estate, really everything for the home is intimidating. And especially when you get into investment, like investing, like it's like this big word that everyone is afraid of. And they think that they have to be this multimillionaire to be able to get into that. But, you know, it's not necessarily that. And a lot of times, you know, when I've seen there's people that, you know, their first time, their first home purchase turns into an investment property when they move on to their second or however it's done. But there's not necessarily a defined moment in someone's life when they're ready to have an investment property. Right, exactly. And when I was getting my real estate license, the instructor actually said, you know, the best thing you can do is get really uh, well versed with clients that are investors. And in my head, an investor was like, because this was five and a half years ago, I'm like, oh, that to me is like somebody in a suit, like an older man or something like that. When in reality, most of the investors that I work with now are like in their 20s and 30s. They're brand new investors, but they have so much more knowledge now, partially because of social media, um, that it's not as scary as I think people thought before. Like you think investor and you're like, oh, they have to like have hedge funds and like all this stuff. And when in reality, you could really start with like $12,000 if you have it saved and invest with a friend. That's how I started my first real estate investing for my personal use. And it really is fun to kind of see the evolution, especially with people closer to my age that that I can like educate them on that. Without a doubt. And the thing is, you just mentioned you can start with $12,000. Like, you know, that's not a lot of money. What type of homes, what type of properties are we looking at? 
um, and, and opportunities in the sense of the, in the investment world. So it's mainly like if you're starting with a budget like that, like 12 to 20,000, I recommend investing with someone who's maybe like handy. My, some of my right. best investor like duos are couples where one person has a really good eye for design and can kind of like renovate the project on a budget because they are so like into the aesthetics. Right. And then the other partner will do a lot of the handy work and stuff like that and they'll work on it together. Also, if, if that's not you know, your forte, investing into smaller things to start, like a duplex, something that you can house hack and live in one side and then have that uh, mortgage on the other side pay or the income on the other side pay for your mortgage. That's what I recommend for people like maybe trying to move out of their parents' house right. and starting like getting the ball rolling. But even like the little condos that are, you know, maybe not by the beach, but they're 200,000, just starting to get that like ROI and getting comfortable understanding how it works and how it's not only the cash flow, it's the equity that you're building over time. So that's why the location is so important. When I first started selling real estate, because I'm from Pompano Beach, you know, I know the area, I know which ones, you know, are up and coming. I know which ones are kind of more established. Right. And a lot of people that come to us will say, I want to invest in Miami or I want to invest in Palm Beach. And I have to kind of educate them on those areas are at a premium. You want to kind of like go to the areas that are not there yet, like Hollywood, absolutely, like Dania, like Pompano Beach has now blown up. But five years ago, it was not that way where I literally had to beg investors to come to Pompano. They would be in Fort Lauderdale and they're like, I don't want to even go there. And then now they've made tons of money on those investments because of the speed in which Pompano has exploded. Absolutely. That can help it in a lot of places. And there's so many little pockets because South Florida is different. I'm originally from Boston. Um, you know, you'll have entire cities that are pretty much like the same. Where here in South Florida, it's so transient. You'll have a multi million dollar neighborhood next to a neighborhood that you might not want to walk through yes. at night and and vice versa. And that's what really makes real estate special because it's being able to see those gems and opportunity, not just necessarily for today, but three, five, 10 years down the road. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. South Florida is so unique in that way where literally one street from another is completely different, especially when it comes to short-term rentals. When we have buyers from out of state and they'll say, oh, I heard that you know, this city is good. Okay. But where in that city, because right. there's all these city rules and regulations, especially in Miami, especially like in Boca, you can't even Airbnb. So you really have to know exactly what the rules are with each city, how long it takes for the licensing, all that stuff, because that factors into the investment because right. the longer it's off the market, you know, the more time you're not making that income. So we have to know all that stuff. And I can speak personally to that because I have a property actually in Lauderdale by the sea. Okay. And seven day minimum. It's been a nightmare <laughs> because it's a smaller community and they're just doing their job. But um, for me to get my business tax receipt, you know, they bring in every department from building to fire yes. to, I mean, everyone across the board. And 30 years ago, there was a garage that was converted that wasn't permitted. So literally I've been sitting on this property for almost a year and a half Yeah, and it's painful, but yeah. I, I see the light at the end of the tunnel. Like it, I'm almost there. Um, but you have to know everything about the property. It's not just, you know, the ROI, the everything you, you should dig into and in, in every city, it might not scrutinize everything as much, but if something wasn't permitted, yeah. you know, they are coming in um, from my experience in this specific community. Yeah, they're coming in to inspect before you can ever put it on Airbnb or VRBO, which is not typical. So right. like you're saying, typically, if you were buying a primary residence and the garage wasn't permitted 30 years ago, you probably wouldn't care. Exactly. Right? And most people wouldn't. They'd say, I'm just going to, you know, take the risk because the city's not knocking on your door every day, right. but with Airbnb, they are. So I run into that a lot where it'll be several months where they're like, I'm trying to get this cleared out or a seller, you know, put in a tiki hut that wasn't permitted. Right. That stuff happens a lot. So it's super, super important. And like you said, Lauderdale by the sea, they have a seven day minimum. Yep. So you can only rent, you know, a week plus, which in your case though, the equity that you're going to build long term in Lauderdale by the sea is pretty much a short, a sure bet. Right. You know, like that's Absolutely. a solid place to invest. If you had bought a property in, you know, out in Parkland or, or a plantation and you were having that same issue, you might not feel as secure. But, right. you know, that's kind of like there's so many moving parts of it. But like you said, like the licensing for Pompano is totally different from the licensing for Deerfield and right. totally different from the licensing elsewhere. We actually opened our own property management business 
my husband and I, he owns a title company. Okay. So a lot of the clients. That works out. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the clients that we work with um, use him. And then he gives me a lot of legal advice, which is great. Right. Um, but we tried to, I opened my brokerage and we opened the property management business at the same time. It is so much more intensive than you would ever think like all of the jobs and all the things that you have to do with the licensing, all that stuff. But it taught us a lot about the city regulations and like what you have to do to get the property ready. But people really underestimate what goes into the management. I think because right. they see, Oh, they're charging me 20% of my income, but it's not a passive investment. Like right. you have to be there when somebody says, Oh, I need a spoon. Like on a Saturday at 2 PM, you got to run over there and give them a spoon. You no, know? absolutely. And, and that's the thing because there's so many things and there's things that also go wrong in the property. You need someone going in and out, checking everything, making sure everything works. I assume that's all part of the checklist. There's a oh, checklist yeah. when you go in uh, managing properties, but that's a, that's a topic that I really want to go into. We can go into that now or wait till later, but um, so you have your own property management company. We did. I sold or you did. it. You got, I mean, I didn't okay. sell it. I literally gave it away right. because I could have sold it, but I said, I just want these clients taken care of. Like right. I just want them to be super happy. And I didn't have the time to dedicate to the property management with my brokerage and obviously having two kids. So I was like, I just want my clients to be super happy. So I found a company that had been managing for like seven years, had managed for other clients of mine and okay. just kind of gave the business away. Yeah, because I've been doing research on that because it, it, it's a lot yes. and you have to stay on top of it. But how do you know, or what should, what should a Airbnb owner ask or what are the questions that they should know to ask a potential property management company to make sure that they're hiring the right one? Okay. So there's a lot of different things. So there's management companies that will help you get the property up and running, which means like, let's say you have a furnished property, but there's certain pieces that you need and you live in Boston. You need somebody on the ground to like, at least accept the packages, put them in. Right. Uh, we have people that we refer out to that are strictly like Airbnb decorators. So they'll go in and they'll airbnb the property, make it, you know, cause that affects the ROI for sure. Insanely. Even a mural on the wall could give you, you know, so much extra money. So you have to think with Airbnb how people are going to view their experience. So let's say it's a bachelorette trip right. and they want to like, have somebody come cook at the house or they want to like do flip cup in the back or whatever you need to understand that people are visualizing what photos they're going to take and a lot of it is social media like right. like you need the backdrops all that stuff so you have to be super creative that's one part of it then the other side of the management if the property is ready to go they assist with the licensing that's a huge thing uh, that can take three weeks that could take three months it just right. depends on who you have we even have people at the city that expedite permits for that reason um and then day to day they're managing the platform you want to ask what they're doing to market the property so the reason why i even started a property management company was like if i have this reach on social media i can help my clients by promoting their properties on social media absolutely if you yourself are a content creator and you want to invest in Airbnb, it's like you have a leg up because right. you have an audience already. You can customize the property exactly how you want and really market that to your followers. But for an everyday investor, you want a marketing company that is really well versed with like AI and knowing how to market online. Facebook ads, stuff like that, that's, that's, is right, kind that's of outdated now, yeah. like, or, you know, it works to some extent, but there are a lot of platforms that you can use. The only thing that I, warn people about you don't want to do everything virtual you don't want a property management company that's completely virtual because like i said who's going to bring them the spoon when they need a spoon right so, absolutely um we have management companies there's one that we refer out to now where it's kind of a hybrid because they're really really good at at managing their own properties and marketing them and using that ai but then they also have people on the ground who will do, you know, repairs, stuff like that. Because I have sellers who will sell their Airbnbs and they are self-managed where they haven't seen the property in four months. Right. And we go to list it and there's like holes in the wall. There's this missing, this is broken, the AC is not working, whatever. So the biggest thing is you don't want to lose sight of the maintenance of your property because even if you're losing a little bit of money month to month by paying that management fee, the equity long term, it's going to make up for right. it. If you have a well-maintained house, people can tell not usually of pictures, but 
when they go into a property, they can tell if something's maintained well or not. I look right. at the baseboards. I look at like these little things that are indicators of, is this the kind of person that changes their AC regularly that like, you know, keeps up with their house. If it's not that way, you're going to lose money. Right. So it's, if I were to buy an Airbnb today, I would get like top tier management because that's not only going to help maintain your property, but the reviews are super important. If you get like three bad reviews on Airbnb, you're out. Right. So really high quality finishes, making sure everything's super, super clean. That's the number one. Right. Um, and the better reviews you get, the better clout you have on those platforms, the more you're going to be seen, the higher rates you're going to get over time. Because they will optimize and push yes. the higher reviews, better review Absolutely. properties. Absolutely. And obviously there's different clientele. You know, somebody that's going into a property that... Um, might cost a couple hundred dollars a night versus someone right. that it might be $1,500 a night. Right. Um, you know, obviously there's different targets, different finishes, different experiences, um, different layout, location, things like that. Right. Um, you know, for the luxury properties out there, speaking to that first, you know, what is what would you say is the differentiating factor? Would you say it's overall the finishes or do the appliances matter? I mean, what, are, what are the... They actually do. It's weird because... I, the way that I get a lot of this information is through talking to property managers or being in the field. Like okay. it's not research that I'm doing online. It's like being in the field and actually hearing experiences and all that stuff. So finishes are super important. Surprisingly, you're right. Like the appliances, they make a difference. It just makes a difference overall. Even if it's an 1800 square foot house next to another 1800 square foot house, if one has vaulted ceilings, you're going to get more money. If one has uh, better appliances, you're going to make more money. If they, if it's not looked at as like a quick flip, you'll make right. more. And th it's more so to get the repeat clientele that will come back to that property because they had a good experience. You kind of want to like think about when you're staying at a hotel and how everything is just right and everything's like right. luxurious kind of feeling. People want it. People are comparing, you know, staying in an Airbnb to a hotel. So you have to have that same level. And then the customer service is like the number one, because think about it, you can just pick up a phone and call the concierge and say, Hey, can I have this? Whereas with an Airbnb, you know, there's, right. there's different ways that people manage it. And you'd be surprised how many people don't offer great customer service. So then it makes it seem like Airbnb as a whole is like not an ideal place to stay. But right. In reality, a lot of people, it, that's the only thing that works for them, like families, people in big groups, all that stuff. But the luxurious side of things, like an Airbnb Lux, a lot of times, you know, I never want a client to like overspend on the property itself, obviously. So we have to factor in like, does it make sense for this client to have a waterfront? Is that going to bring them in enough extra income to make up for the purchase price? Right. So it really has to all kind of meld together. Um even, but you know, our beach, our beachside properties, the ones that are like have a private beach, I sell a lot in Hillsborough Shores um, and it allows Airbnb, but that income is a lot of times comparable to a waterfront because of the proximity to the beach because they can actually use that amenity. Right. So there's, you know, a lot of different factors with the luxurious properties, um, but they definitely, it makes a difference, the finishes for sure. Without a, and then talking about that ROI, because yeah. you're going... You mentioned before you do the whole analysis you're doing all the work for your potential buyers which is absolutely amazing i assume most brokerages out there don't go as far as you guys do no well, um, i actually have a lot of realtors that call me and they say i have an investor <laughs> client i don't know what to do i'm just going to send them to you even if they're you know local right. but i really like made sure that we specialized in that and like i enjoy that side of it more so than just the residential so um, yeah, we're really consistent with that. So talking about that ROI, when you're calculating, what are the major factors that you're putting into, like when you're doing your analysis and right. turning that over to the potential buyer, the investor, what does that look like? What's, what's the process? Okay. So the way that we do it, so there's platforms like air DNA that you can use to like check rates. But from my perspective of managing and, you know, being in this for a long time, it's not accurate at all. So <laughs> Like we said, kind of like social Florida, media <laughs> right, like, <laughs> and everything like <laughs> exactly like and a lot of people rely on their DNA, but I'm like looking at it and I'm like, how can you generalize this whole area when, like we said, South Florida, every street is different. Right. So we go really, really like into the app itself and I average out all the rates throughout the year on several properties. So I'm not looking at 
just December. I'm not looking at just January because those are like the best months sometimes. So we can't just look at the winter. We got to look at the summer. We got to look at every single season, average all of those rates out to get to the best number. Now in Pompano Beach, 90% occupancy rates like are normal. Like right. that's, that's pretty typical, but I'm not going to send a client something at a 90% occupancy rate. We right. usually do like 75%, 70, 80%. Um, so then you're getting that gross income. But then the thing with Airbnb, as opposed to like a multifamily investment where you can charge those, um, expenses to the tenant, you can't do that with Airbnb. So you have to deduct taxes, insurance, electric, water, pool, pool heater. If you have one, you got to like a lot that expense in um everything that you have to use to dress the property so that's why when we're looking at properties for clients let's say one property is 795 and the other one's 750 and one is fully furnished turnkey you could just go to the city and get it licensed or one is not furnished but it's cheaper i'm going to go with the higher price one because it's going to save me time it might take six months to get a couch you know absolutely every single month that it's not on the platform, you're losing money. So you have to really think about that stuff. And then also like, what are the expenses going to be that are random? Like that will just come up because right. if, again, if a property is a fixer upper, you've got to allot those expenses. And what if the AC breaks and it's eight years old and blah, blah, blah. And then that eats into your ROI. So we have to really get like granular on it. And then also the management fee. Most management companies are running their management fee off of the gross income. So even though you might have 50K in your pocket after expenses, they're still running that 20% at the 100K total income. Right. We found a management company now that does it off of the net income, which is amazing. Oh, great. Which I've never come across before, but those are all of the things that we're factoring in and their mortgage. So if they have a mortgage, that has to be factored in also. Um, a lot of the really like ideal candidates to buy right now with Airbnb, like a turnkey ready to go is like a 1031 exchange because okay. it's run as cash. You right. don't have to factor in that mortgage. So we do a lot of 1031 exchanges. Um, and yeah, we, we do that for every property because at the end of the day, I'm not going to go show a client a property and then later run the numbers and be like, oh my God, this doesn't make sense. Right. You know, <laughs> like that's a waste of everybody's time. So we really try to like be super conservative too, because it is a projection. I'm never promising you're going to make this amount. Right. But I want to help them out. I want them to make as much money as possible. So it's like, how can we brainstorm to do that? And I'll give them ideas. Like if it's a big property with a huge backyard, let's contact, you know, a yoga instructor that can come in and you can have them on hand and you can advertise, hey, do you guys want to do a yoga day one day and we'll have the instructor come? Or there's like Airbnb for boats. So if you're selling a waterfront and you have 75 foot dock, I would say rent out half the dock so that you get consistent income. You can get like $1,500 a month on that. Um, And then the other half of the dock so that you don't have the liability of renting out an actual boat, which some people do. Um, You just have the Airbnb service, come and pick them up, go on a boat ride, all that stuff. But you're offering that service with the booking so that people choose that over the next house that looks almost identical. So you have to kind of even golf carts, offering a car, like people do offer boats. It is a liability, but you just have them sign a waiver. I mean, everything's a liability. Golf carts, everything. I mean, exactly. But, um, you know, so talking about that and you meant you mentioned furnishing, you mentioned all of these different items because furnishing does get expensive. And especially in today's world, you know, during COVID, post COVID, yes, it literally could take three months, six months, who knows to get a sofa. Right. Um, because you know, I mean, you, you can probably get something, but you don't also want to just throw something in just to have it there. Um, right. and that, and you know, that's a factor as well. Like, yeah. you know, what you're going to spend, what is a realistic budget for furnishing an entire property? Because you know, that can get crazy. Right. Yeah. I mean, the aesthetics are everything with Airbnb. It's not like a normal investment property. It really is. That's why I feel like people who are creative, are really good with that. And yep. it's like an ideal purchase for them. Whereas maybe a businessman who runs a business in Colorado and like, doesn't really have the time would be better with, you know, an eight unit apartment building. That's, you know, easy money. Right. So, and that brings me to my, my next point, because there's a, obviously a major differentiating factor as far as purchasing a property for Airbnb, short-term rental, um, versus, you know, duplex, some type of complex yes. for more longer term tenants, people that are going to stay there. Right. You know, 
Is that the deciding factor just solely as far as, you know, if somebody doesn't want to deal with the management or when you look at numbers wise, it location, different factors where, you know what, this just doesn't fit for a short term rental, doesn't have the desirability, but perfect for long term. Right. So with my clients, because I, I have clients that have bought and sold multiple properties with me and that I just kind of have in my mind, in the back of my mind. So when I'm in the field and I come across a property it will ding in my head where I'm like, oh, I got to send this to this guy because this would be perfect for him. Right. Um, instead of having them on that steady stream of let me just send you everything. Right. So those are the kind of clients that like they are no bullshit. Like they want it to make sense or don't send it to me. Don't waste my time. Right. So that's where I'm thinking and I'll kind of interview them. Honestly, I ask them a lot of questions on like an initial intake call where I'm like, what's your lifestyle like? What? What, what's your day to day? Like, what can you realistically dedicate to this? Do you want just a financial investment? Okay, we have that. We have, you know, people come to us all the time with, you know, do you have somebody that can just invest like a million dollars in this project and they'll make 25% because it's a new build or something. Right. And it's just strictly financial. And that's where a lot of these business owners they don't have the time, but they have the capital. So they'll even like a restaurant opportunity. Somebody else comes up with the idea. Somebody else has the whole business plan set up and they just need that capital. So that's a lot of my, you know, I guess higher ticket clients are, are buying stuff like that. And then I have other clients that want, you know, a hotel, like a chain hotel on the beach. And those are things that are not typically on the market. So those are the off market deals that we have to like prospect for and make a lot of calls to sellers like right. and really like be consistent about it. I pretty much I don't know how, but I started getting a ton of off market deals. And that's how I did a lot of deals this past couple of years is just having that like exclusive pro property that is not on the MLS for everybody. And those are oftentimes the best deals because it's not, you know, if I put like a really good deal on the MLS, it's going to be a frenzy. Right. Whereas if I have a really good deal and I can market it to my own buyers and stuff like that, usually, you know, I can get it, get it done if the numbers make sense. It has to make sense on both sides, obviously. But, um, but yeah, it's really different for every client. It's like kind of a, you know, you really have to ask a lot of questions <laughs> right. and make sure because you don't want the person to be pissed like, oh, I'm in this situation now and I thought I was going to this was going to be easy money and it's not. Right. So Airbnb is, I would say, the most late, like not labor intensive, but requires the most management, whereas like those really just financial investments are very, very passive. And then in the in between are going to be like those multifamilies. And just off of that. You could like I had a duplex and I had amazing tenants and they were paying way under market value when we bought the property, which is common right. down here where people will own a property for 20 years and they just never really change the rent. Instead of kicking those tenants out to get like the max max rent, I was like, these are great tenants. Let's negotiate. Let's you know, they've been paying really under for like six years. Let's just meet in the middle. And then it's not a headache right. because you could you know, get a tenant that is a terror and then it's just as much work as the Airbnb. <laughs> so right. you really have to like vet, vet, vet those people for sure. Definitely. And something that, you know, there's a lot of platforms out there that you mentioned before talking Airbnb, but what, what's the biggest difference between Airbnb and Verbo? They're pretty, pretty comparable. Identical, yeah. I mean, people use the same platform, like the amount of bookings that come in from each, I would say Airbnb is more just cause it's like more well known, right. but they're pretty much the same thing. Okay. And then, you know, talking, I mean, a lot has changed through COVID, you know, all these short-term rentals, people weren't necessarily staying in hotels as much because of the fear factor. So that probably completely boosted the industry and yes. really brought a whole different level where people previously, they may have not ever even looked into renting an Airbnb right. where now they are and they live by and they swear by it. Um, do you see this as a trend or is it here to stay? So in South Florida, before Airbnb was even like uttered, you know, I used to help people who owned a lot of vacation rentals. Okay. So they had like, there was this one couple I remember had this business of a bunch of vacation rentals. And that was kind of how it went off in my head where I was like, it makes sense down here because it's so consistent. 
because we don't have like months out of the year where we're boarding up the house. Right. The season is all year round. So in South Florida, I feel like we are an anomaly. Like we have that amazing edge that it's all year round. It's always been a vacation destination. So before the people who own vacation rentals, it was almost like a secret that they were making that much money. Right. And um, my other clients, they were, they kind of caught on to that where they were, you know, typical multifamily investors and then moved into Airbnb. I think it's going to depend on location. Like if I had a, you know, I know that the market was booming in Idaho for like primary residences. Would I buy an Airbnb there? No. Right. Would I like I if I'm <laughs> I'm you don't want to go there for I'm vacation, here, <laughs> but I'm not going to buy an Airbnb in a place that doesn't make sense. So even ca- uh, California, like so many people over the past two years have called me from California saying, get me out of here. I want to live in Florida or they'll buy an Airbnb in Florida with me. And then they're like, OK, I want to move. Right. And, you know, maybe 10 years ago, I would say, yeah, buy an Airbnb in California because it was like a hot spot. Now it's not really that way. Right. So you kind of have to go with like Texas is a great market. Um, I even rented Airbnb in Scottsdale, Arizona in the middle of nowhere, like right. literally the middle of nowhere. But they decked out the property so insanely. Like I said, they had like photo opportunities, like murals. They really like went crazy with the putt-putt course, all this stuff. $1,900 a month, a night for a three bedroom house. Like that's crazy. You know, you can't, you don't have the ability to maximize your income like you do with Airbnb with any other investment. Right. So I think the people that are really dedicated to it where they're like, this is my business. And like, I have the best customer service and I have the cleanest Airbnb in the area. And it like looks the most marketable and the pictures are amazing. Those are the ones that will thrive. I think the other properties that are not as well taken care of, they're not as well presented, everything, right. those will become annual rentals. Right. Yeah. That, make, that makes sense. Um, because, you know, obviously it, when you're looking anywhere, a hotel, a resort, whatever, that you want to envision yourself having fun there. Right. And if it looks like a dive, I mean, right. you know. You get what you pay for. Exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, you know, and, and you were mentioning like, you know, $1,900 a night and things like that. What is like that fine line of maximizing bed space in an Airbnb? Because that's also something where, you know, the amount of beds ultimately, you know, that could be a dictating factor for what you can right. charge, um, you know, for a three bedroom or four bedroom, how many people should that sleep? So typically with Airbnb, four bedroom is ideal because then you can house two families. So oftentimes right. you'll have like two en suites in a four bedroom. So we can say, oh, like, you know, two families and their kids can stay in the other rooms. And that's usually like the ideal property. Now, if I came across a three bedroom, two bath, but it had a garage that I could like quickly convert and not even, you know, structurally convert it, just like put flooring in that's that you could take off, make it a game room, put a bit bunk bed in there, maximize the space that you have. It's really important because you don't want just like an empty garage. What are the, what is a, Airbnb guests going to do with the garage, you know? So those are kind of the ways that you can hack it, um, and make more because the more people that you can house, the better, obviously. And like I said, most of the people doing Airbnb are like traveling in groups. So yeah, the more bedrooms, the better. But once you hit like a certain point where it's like five, six bedrooms, you might plateau a little bit, but two bedroom, is not as ideal as a four bedroom, obviously. Like the four bedroom is really key and the pool. The pool is everything. everything. Down here especially. Yeah. Yeah. So like that's the thing too. If somebody buys a house and they're like, oh, I could just put a pool in. You got to know like what pool company you're going to use. Some pool companies are on like a wait list where they'll do each pool at one time. Right. So it might only be a hole in your backyard for eight weeks. That's what I would go with if I had an Airbnb and I could just block it off for those eight weeks. Right. But you really have to know like who you're going to work with first because it could take forever. And that goes into everything home design and home improvement. We deal with it every single day. Like there's companies that do our show where they have backlogs. We're like, okay, I'll get to you in in six months or nine months from now. And there's other people that you know, they're busy, but they know how to manage their immediate business and have the infrastructure to be able to do that. Um, Especially in the pool industry during COVID, that was like one of the hottest things that everyone was expanding outside because that's the easiest way to gain square footage, livable square footage to your home. Right. Um, But yeah, there was a lot of nightmare stories and you hear them every day for every industry, but for pools particular, um, you know, that's something you don't want to mess around with. No. And I mean, the pricing is so different now. Like it used to be 
I had a company that I would refer out to that was like 25 grand for a pool, hot tub and pavers and yeah. like amazing. Now it's like 75 grand without but, the pavers. Yeah. Without the pavers, <laughs> just a pool. Nothing yeah. else. <laughs> Seriously. It's literally a just hole in the, the ground. Hole in the ground. <laughs> you're, you're right. And, and it's crazy. And that, I mean, a lot of that was materials and time and they could basically, you want a pool, this is the price and right. we'll get to, it's I mean, demand. exactly. And listen, like there's no shortage of cash buyers still moving to South Florida. Right. So it's like, you know, if they can charge it, they will. Without a doubt. And talking about cash buyers versus getting loans, um, you know, you turn on your computer or open up your social media, you're hearing about rates right. and you know, a lot of people are scared and they, they look at that as something as, okay, it's not the time to buy where in fact, that's not necessarily the case. No, I actually think like the summer months here are the best times to buy. Cause it's the slowest. Right. And like, um, I would say over the past two years when the interest rates have been really low, my primary buyers are like young first time home buyers buying Airbnbs right now that the interest rates have gone up and it's slowed down a little bit. Like the inventory is starting to get higher. This is when my cash buyers that are experienced investors come out of the woodwork and they're like, find me a deal, you know? So that's the real shift that I've seen is that those buyers are like hungry right now because they, they know that this is the time to negotiate. Whereas in March, you had to pay 200K over ask for a property where now you could probably buy the same exact property for maybe 200K less because of the lack of competition. Right. But it's going to pick up again. You know, like South Florida is just like that. Every With, year it's like this. Without a doubt. And, and speaking to South Florida has become probably the one of the top two destinations in yes. the country because there's so many financial benefits as well. Bring businesses down here. There are entire corporations that are relocating their staff and their staff are glad to move to South Florida because of, you know, those income benefits and taxes and everything. But, um, even, yeah, sorry, even like celebrities and stuff, I've been hearing that people are installing, um, like studios in houses now because so many people from California are moving here and like artists and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool without a doubt. And, and there's always ever changing trends and things like that. That's going just into home design and what makes a home most sellable and things like that. But you know, this is really interesting because talking about this Airbnb component, short-term rental investment property, you know, there's not as many people out there that are truly talking about, okay, here's the formula on how to do it. We do it. Um, you know, this is what's worth this type of property and elsewhere. You buying, you know, if it's for yourself, not even for your clients, if you were to buy Airbnbs anywhere in South Florida, okay, what's your top three to five areas, areas, neighborhoods, areas? Yeah. Okay. So I would do Deerfield Beach just because of how easy it is to get licensing there. Okay. It's way easier than Pompano Beach. (laughs) I live in Pompano (laughs) Beach and I love it, but the city is like, like they're really tough. Um, so Deerfield is definitely the easiest and because it borders Boca okay. and you can't do Airbnb, Airbnb in Boca, like all the people that want to stay in Boca will stay in Deerfield. Okay. So those are always like really, really well rented out, like super consistent. Hollywood is another place that I would invest just because it's right in between Fort Lauderdale that's at a premium and like Sunny Isles, North Miami that's at a premium and Aventura and all that. So yep. I would invest right in between. You always kind of want to look at like like Pompano is right in between really nice Boca, really nice Fort Lauderdale. And then it's like that in the in between kind of place, even though you would probably get more like a higher rate in downtown Fort Lauderdale, you're going to be paying a premium to buy there. Right. Uh, so I'm looking, like I said, I'm looking at not only the cash flow but the equity over time, which is why we don't even touch Airbnb arbitrage or anything like that. Like, right especially because a lot of times it screws over the seller or the owner because they don't even know what's going on. Um, But yeah, I would want to build the equity in either Deerfield Beach. I mean, Pompano Beach is a great place to invest, but you kind of had to buy like a couple of years ago for it to be really, really profitable. You still can. Um, There's always a deal to be had. Oakland Park is great. We just had um, a client buy in Oakland Park and she like decked out the Airbnb. It's all pink and super cute. And that area is super close to downtown Fort Lauderdale, but you're not paying those crazy prices. Right. Um, Same thing with Dania. Same thing with, honestly, like I love that North Miami area. Right. Because a lot of people are moving north from there because of all the traffic. Okay. Anything, honestly, like, as a long-term investment, I would go north. Okay. I would go to like Stewart. I would go to, but 
north in Palm Beach, the Airbnb rules get really tricky. So okay. you have to literally have, we have like a map of like of where you can, <laughs> where you should where go. You and can, there's a lot of yeah. places red, all in red, yeah. not stay away. <laughs> exactly. But a lot of people are moving north. All of my like empty nesters are moving right. north. They okay. all want to live in Stewart. Um, uh, Port St. Lucie, yeah. stuff like that. Well, Port St. Lucie, I mean, you can, I mean, it, the affordability and it's probably one of the, and a lot of young families are moving to Port St. Lucie as well. Yeah. My dad's actually moving there and they're going to get an RV and just travel. That's That'll awesome. That'll be like their home base. Very yeah. cool. That's awesome. And as far as, you know, we've discussed a lot, yeah. um, a lot of different areas, you and yourself, you've, you've turned into an influencer, you know, you obviously you're, you know, you, you're extremely active on social media. You're always educating, inspiring, um, giving those little pieces of information. Um, a lot of people are out there as far as assuming that all the information that they're receiving is correct. Right. Right. Um, you know, this is kind of like a two sided question. First of all, who do you follow as a person that is offering valuable information within the industry that you can relate to? And then also what should be people, what should people be weary of in the right. sense of, is this too good to be true? Right. So the best advice I've ever gotten in my real estate career is that no one can predict the market. Right. No one. And, you know, you talk to multimillionaires every day. They give their opinion. You go on social media and then you hear a 20 year old talking about their opinion on the market. Yeah. I don't trust anyone. Right. I'm going to be honest. Right. Like there's no account that I'm following where I'm like, that's how I'm going to dictate my investing or right. dictate. However, Many, many, many people do. Right. And a lot of the people that contact us, it's because they see one of my TikToks, but then they might see a TikTok following that saying information that doesn't add up with reality. Right. Um, because at the end of the day, we're responsible. Like I'm responsible for the information I put out because it brings in clients. So right. I have to make sure that even if I know that a property is making like 15%, you know, I have to be as conservative as possible, even with my content. Um, to make sure that I'm not making claims that are not realistic. Right. And then on the other hand, and in a social media influencer that's just doing that, that is like just making videos about real estate and they're not in the industry, they can say whatever they want. Exactly. There's no repercussions. So we have a lot of work on our end where we might get a referral from one of those investors, but they say, I need a 30% return <laughs> and I need a four bedroom and I need it to be exactly this property. I need it to be this price. Right. It doesn't exist. Right. Okay. So I have to really like reel it in and dial it back and, and educate my agents at the brokerage to say, this is how you navigate that. And this is how you educate the clients because they come to us because we specialize in this. And instead of us like begging for their business, it's like you came to us because we are the best at this and we're going to guide you and put you in a realistic investment that makes sense for you. Right. But we're never going to say, you're going to make this much money. And like, what? Because everyone we'd would be do screwed. it. Yeah. I would be like, oh my God. So I'd be right. getting calls every day. So, um, so yeah, so that's something that we navigate a lot. And it's so funny because, um, you know, I've asked my mom before, she's been in real estate for a long time, but in mortgages. And I was like, in 2008, you know, what's, right. what kind of like was the thing that made real estate slow down so much? And she said, the worst thing that can happen is people just doing nothing right. and just like stalling, you know? So when you see those videos that are like, there's a recession coming and yeah. blah, 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 <laughs> people are like, oh, you know, like clutching their pearls. But at the end of the day, like you said, this is the most opportune time to negotiate. So the people who are really like well-educated on the reality of that can make a ton of money. Right. But the people that are getting swayed from like one video to the next, and it might not even be real estate. It might be, they call me to make a real estate investment. And then the next video they see is about crypto and maybe right. they change their yeah. mind and want to do crypto. Right. So we have to kind of always know what's going on in the market at all times. It's not like one blanket statement that I make today about Airbnb would be true in two years from now, you know, like it always Absolutely. changes. So you have to really understand that and understand that, even though I might be putting out truthful information, they might be hearing something else and you just have to kind of like bring everybody to reality. <laughs> no, definitely. And that, and that in itself, I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into that and people have to also understand that you have to know where the video is coming from. If it is coming from a professional, chances are you would hope that they're at you're, they're putting the video out based on an actual experience that right. are true numbers. But also I related to HETV. 
when you watch HGTV, you're seeing them buy a, a, a mansion right. for four hundred thousand dollars in Detroit, and right. they renovate the whole thing five thousand square feet for a hundred thousand dollars. Like you know, that's not you realistic. Know that's not real. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So, and then when you're in South Florida. You know, I mean, you can't flip a house overnight. I mean, you need basically right. a permit to change a toilet. Right. You know, so there's a lot of things and it's really understanding your market um, and who's giving that information and going to the authority figures that are in your market itself. Because, you know, also for you, I mean, it's great to get every single client, but also every client isn't for you and every right. client's not for the next person. There is a perfect fit for everybody. And that's why there's enough business to go around. But knowing the source, knowing the location, that's all those factors. The, yeah. the knowledge, the knowledge is everything. And that's what I really try to like teach the agents. And that's why I don't have that many. I only have 15 because I'm like, I need you guys to be the most knowledgeable on right. the subject because these investors are experienced. They're not all first time investors. Most of them aren't and they know what they're talking about. So you've got to know your shit. You right. know, like, exactly. you got to really, really know your shit to like be able to navigate that and be able to say, no, that person was wrong. This is what is really going on. You have to be confident in what you know. And that only, I feel like the confidence only comes from really doing your research and being in the market physically. Absolutely. So we've discussed a lot. Is there any other areas that you want to go into to really, you know, offer any ad additional advice? I'm trying to think. of what I <laughs> <laughs> um, Let me think. I mean, I would just say that if you you know, there's a lot of ways that people are making money now, especially young people. I got right. off the phone with someone yesterday and she's making a ton of money. She's super, super smart, like great with marketing. Like that's the kind of person where I'm like, this is the, this is where you need to put your money and like make it work for you. Because once you start, it's just a snowball and it just gets bigger and bigger and you get more and more experience and knowledge and all that stuff. Um, but for people to understand that, like I said in the beginning, my first real estate investment, I invested $12,500 and I did it with friends and right. I didn't think, oh, that's lame that I can't do it on my own. It was like, I grew up in the 2008 crash. Like I was afraid I lived in like a scarcity mindset for right. a long time where I was like, I just need this amount of savings in my account so that I like feel okay and feel comfortable. But in reality, like once I started real estate investing and I started actually even investing in stocks too, like it, it eased my mind because I'm like, I am setting up security for right. myself and no matter what income comes in or what happens with the market, whatever, I have that security and I'm like building that equity over time. Definitely. And to a point to what you just mentioned is, you know, diversity and diversifying yes. your portfolio is extremely important. It doesn't yes. matter what industry you want, stocks, you want real estate, you yes. want to be across the board. Exactly. Exactly. And then I have a couple of questions just okay. to leave everyone with. So for first timers, what would you say is your number one tip for a regular first time home buyer? Okay. Regular first time home buyer, my number one tip is do as much as you can yourself. So if there's like detail, like you want to paint or pick out whatever, of course you can hire a contractor, but a lot of times you're going to end up doing that stuff yourself anyway. So I would say to do a lot of the handy stuff yourself. That's what my parents always did growing up. They like, you know, my stepdad's 75 now and he'll still paint the outside of a house. Like right. all those things, it saves you a lot of money. And even though it's a pain in the ass sometimes, like take a few weekends and work on the house yourself right. so that you're not pouring sweat all that equity. money. Yeah, sweat <laughs> equity, exactly. Absolutely, because, you know, for that, it's also going to better your experience and know what it takes when you are hiring a contractor. If, if it, in the exactly. future, if you don't want to do it, you at least right. know what goes into the process. Exactly. Um, second tip what would you say is the best tip for a first time investment purchaser? So think first about your lifestyle, then think about how much you want to invest and then look at the numbers before you're looking at the property. Don't like let your emotions get in the way of your investment because at the end of the day, especially with Airbnb, that's a factor that's not involved in regular investing. So like when you look at a multifamily, if the numbers don't make sense, it's not a big deal, right. like on to the next. If you fall in love with an Airbnb property and it doesn't make sense, like you got to let it go. You got to look to the next one. So always, I say, look at the numbers first, take your emotions out of it and be as objective as humanly possible. Yeah, because that, and that's something that a lot of people fall into. Like owning a house, it's a business, whether it's your personal or investment Absolutely. property. And you can't be, emo it's, I mean, it's, if it's your own property, you'll be somewhat emotionally right. attached. But if there's opportunity 
and there is a next step, you know, take advantage of it. Exactly. Exactly. Something else that I've noticed just to leave everyone with, you teach a class. Yes. You have a course. Yes. Do you want to, do you want to give us any information on that before we go? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So it's kind of funny because when I first started real estate, I had already kind of had some social media experience. Like I had my Instagram, whatever, but I really, I went from medical device sales to real estate. So okay. I really just used everything I learned in that in real estate, which is why, you know, I started selling so quickly and people saw that and they're like, help, like, I don't know what to do because the real estate course doesn't teach you anything about how to get clients or the process or how to take a client from a lead to a sale. And that's all things that I had extensive, extensive training in med sales. So I put all of that into my, it used to be my boot camp. Now I've updated it and I've added everything that I've learned over the last year owning a brokerage and how I actually train my agents uh, to be super successful. And there are agents that I have that have seven years of experience and they've doubled their income in one year that they've made in that entire seven years. So the things that I teach as far as gaining business organically, they work for every, like everyone I've taught, they're super happy. They, I have students even in the UK and Australia that use the boot camp. Now I've made it into the playbook. I put everything together and I also have my Airbnb aspect too. So I teach everybody about in real estate investing, whether it's multifamily, whether it's Airbnb, how to get clients, how to take them through the process, how to keep your mindset really good. I genuinely think that success in this industry is like 90% mindset. Absolutely. Because and that's everything so for that matter. Tumultuous. Yeah. yeah. But there's so many times where you could be like, I'm out, you right. know? So it's really aimed to keep people in the game because you can refer back to it whenever you want. Right. So that playbook is on marijuliet.com. All you have to do is go to marijuliet.com and you click learn from Mari and you can access it, but it's 85 videos. It actually has presentations like PDF presentations that I use with the agents uh, for onboarding to train them. Okay. So I don't hold anything back. It's pretty like Here's my secrets. <laughs> yeah, because at the end of the day, you're educating the market. It makes it, you know, a more educated market in the sense of other people that are, you know, discussing properties or anything with real estate exactly. to other people. So um, as far as for anyone that doesn't already follow you, where they where can they find you? So you can find me at Mari Juliet. That's M-A-R-I-J-U-L-I-E-T-T-E. MariJuliet.com. Mari Juliet on Instagram, TikTok. YouTube, I think, is Mari Juliet R E, uh, but I post most of my content on TikTok and Instagram. I'm starting to get into YouTube, um, and I also have a podcast called The Evolution of Confidence that's on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Awesome. Well, I can't thank you enough for being here. This has been amazing. We talked about everything: Airbnb, how to buy a property, getting getting your ROI, how to manage a property, what goes into a successful property, and so much more. I mean, this was absolutely amazing. It was super fun. I'm really, really excited that you have me on today, and I'm excited to share all this info because it's fun. No, and we thank you <laughs> for that. And um, for everybody, you know, if you want to get more information about us and the home show, um, we produce South Florida's largest home design and home improvement expos in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and Palm Beach. We have hundreds of exhibitors every show, thousands of attendees. We have designers, realtors, everything home design and home improvement, so HETV celebrities, and more. Um, but check us out. Go to our website at homeshows.net. Follow us at FL Home Shows. Subscribe to our channel. Get all of the latest in home design and home improvement. But until next time, stay tuned for the next episode.